Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. It's 1 p.m. Um, today, Paul Badry will give us the second talk in his series about derived annular Kolonov-Rozlansky invariance. So take it away, Paul. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for coming back. Um, so yeah, uh, we only just started with uh, categorification uh, last week at the end. Uh, I wanted to only briefly recall what happened there. Um, so I introduced circle bimodules. Uh, so we, we fixed some number n and we looked at bimodules for a polynomial ring and n variables, each considered of degree two. And the two important bimodules were the, the regular bimodule R itself, which we somehow associated with the identity braid on n strands, and uh, this bimodule BI, uh, the bot samuelson bimodule BI, where I ranges between one and n minus one, and it was constructed out of two copies of this polynomial ring, tensored, over invariance under transposition. And that we associated with this other picture, other planar picture with a double edge. And then the, the, cat, the monoidal category of circle bimodules was just constructed as the full subcategory of all graded RR bimodules uh, built from R and B and closed under tensor products, so composition of bimodules, taking direct sums, taking direct summons, and taking grading shifts. Um, and this is a categorification of the Hecke algebra on n strands. Uh, something that I didn't say last time was that there's no need to restrict to just a single number n. You can just consider um, all numbers at the same time. And then there's a very natural operation, namely you can tensor these bi modules over the ground field, over the complex numbers, and you can interpret this as um, a bifunctor, or I don't know if I get my category numbers right now, but it takes you from circle by modules on a, on a pair of circle by modules on n strands and m strands, and it goes to circle by modules on m plus n strands, and we have a topological interpretation for what's going on there. We just put these, these pictures side by side. Um, and this additional tensor product that we have here now, it's not somehow the usual tensoring of bimodules modules over intermediate rings, it's something else. This turns the collection of all of these categories of type A circle bimodules, modules, and similarly for singular circle bimodules, modules, into monoidal two categories. Um, so you now have objects, natural numbers, and you can ten tensoring as these numbers, and then um, everything else is built out of the structures that I've already described. So next step are uh, Routier complexes. So this is where um, we're categorifying somehow the, the images of the Artin generators in the Hecke algebra. So Routier defined chain complexes of circle bimodules, modules um, denoted Ti and t suggestively Ti inverse. And they're just really short chain complexes. Um, so Ti, you can see here. So you put Bi, this bimod Bob Samuelson bimodule, in homological degree zero, and then there's a very natural map to the, bi the regular bimodule R shifted in degree. And um, if you remember that Bi was just built from two copies of R tensored over invariance, um, this map is actually determined by where it sends the tensor one, as one tensor one, just sends that to one, and there's a that describes, a, that specifies a bimodule map of the corresponding degree. So there's a, it's a very short chain complex. It only has somehow uh, two non-trivial chain groups and the differential is the, the usual multiplication map. And if you would like a, a topological picture to keep in mind for this map, um, you can see it here on the right. So the thing on the left is this uh, double edge that I've introduced. On the right, you see the identity braids uh, those are planar pictures, they live in 2D, and so the differential should now be interpreted as a 3D picture connecting the two, and it's drawn here as a, as a singular cobordism. Let's just call it an unzipped foam, because that's what it does, it somehow unzips this double edge. So this is just, just a picture for now, uh, to remember this. Um, the, then there's this other complex, uh, uh, TI inverse, and it, it looks quite symmetric, so there's a, we put bi in homological degree zero, but then the r goes left of it, and we're looking for a chain map from, sorry, we're looking for a differential a bimodule map from r with this minus one shift into bi, and up to scalars, there's really only one thing of the corresponding degree that you could take. Uh, it doesn't have as easy a description as the other one, um, but it's specified as, as determined by where it sends one to, of course. 
um, and it sends one to this xi tensor one minus one tensor xi plus one. Um, and this again gives you a, a short chain complex of i modules and um, the, the, the picture for it is on the right. It's a chain complex with one chain group being this parallel resolution, one being the double edge. And now the differential is, a, is drawn as a zip form. So kind of natural uh, two-dimensional CW complex that you would use to link these two things up. And then there's this theorem of, of Routier that says that under tensoring these chain complexes over, over the intermediate rings R, so if you can tensor bimodules over R to compose them, you can do the same thing for chain complexes built out of them. Um, and these chain complex, this satisfy the braid relations up to homotopy equivalence. So in particular, TI turns to, so TI inverse, what I've denoted TI inverse, turns out to be um, uh, inverse to TI uh, up to homotopy equivalence. Um, and if you have TIs and TI plus ones, they satisfy the braid relations. And for example, if you have TI and TJ and I and J are far apart, these things will also uh, commute up to isomorphism. Um, so this is a, this is a, it's a really fantastic um, gadget, this somatopy category of pseudo pi modules and these OK complexes. Um, and you can interpret OK's result as saying that the homotopy category of um, all pseudo pi modules of type A taken together is an example of a braided monoidal tooth category. So previously I said that circle biomodules in type A form a monoidal two category, and now we also have some categorification of a braiding. Um, so this gives a braided monoidal two category. And if you look in the uh, periodic table of higher categories, you see that a braided monoidal two category is a particular example of a four dimensional category, which is boring at the bottom two levels. And so in some sense, the homotopy category of circle bimodules of type A is, some, is, is one, of the, one of the very few genuinely four-dimensional categorical, four categorical dimensional algebraic structures that we know. How is this related to link homology? I mean, so, so Bouquet complexes apparently give a, a categorical braid group action, but, but what do we do with links? And now there's a, there's a theorem of Kovanov which says that you can compute a link homology theory in the following way. Take a link, present it as a braid closure. This is of course, uh, you can, it's not a canonical way of doing this, so just pick any braid closure representing the link. Um, cut the braid closures till you obtain a braid. Compute the Rocquier complex of that braid, down up to here. Um, and now we have, we have something associated to the braid. Um, but it depends very much on the braid, uh, not just on the link. So, so you do two things to that. First, given such a Rokier complex of circle bimodules, you take the Hoch shield homology of each of the bimodules in that chain complex. So you apply Hoch shield homology, which is a functor, termwise to this complex. That gives a, a chain complex of um, of uh, bi graded vector spaces, if you want. Um, and Hoch shield homology has a trace like property. And if you, so what you would expect at this stage is that first you have a braid invariant, and after taking Hoch shield homology, you have an invariant of braid conjugacy classes. But if you take additionally homology after that, it turns out that this also satisfies the second Markov move. So somehow taking Hochschild homology and then taking homology, um, it gives you something that is, that is invariant under the first and the second Markov move. And then it turns out that it only depends on the, on the link and not on the braid that you chose to represent that link. And because you take first Hochschild homology and then homology, uh, this is sometimes denoted HHH of L. So homology of Hochschild homology. And, and, and now we've, we found three gradings. Uh, the underlying polynomial rings, R and so on, had an internal grading, which is the Q grading. By taking Hochschild homology, you get another grading, Hochschild grading. And, and then in the end, we had chain complexes of such things. So the 
with an additional homology of gradient around. So in the end, we end up with a, with a triply graded uh, vector space associated to link to the link. Um, and this categorifies the Homsley PT invariant of that link. And it coincides with the triply graded uh, invariant defined a little bit earlier by Havana van Drozanski using matrix factorizations. So this is where these uh, Roche complexes enter link homology theory. So now um, I, I started last week's talk by somehow outlining that there are link homologies and then there are annular versions of link homologies. And if you have a categorical invariant of, of braids, then you can get a categorical invariant of of annular braid closures almost for free by using a categorical trace construction. And that's where I'm, where I'm going next. So the, the first kind of categorical trace that you could consider, uh, we could call the vertical trace. And here the idea is that if you have a linear category, you can think of this as a, as a, as a, as a algebra over, over the same field uh, with a collection of orthogonal idempotents. So it's somehow a category is something like a non-unital algebra. And we know how to take the trace or the co-center of an algebra, and we can do the same thing to the category. So let's denote this by HH0. And it's defined in the following way. So we want to take, um, we want to mod out by a commutator relation. So uh, comm commutators um, will implement like this. So we take a direct sum over all objects in the category of endomorphisms of these objects. And then we mod out by, by a trace relation. FG is GF. Whenever F and G are a pair of morphisms um, that uh, compose to endomorphisms. So F runs from, C, from, a, from an object C1 to C2, and G runs the other way back. And now F and G, FG and GF are both endomorphisms. They're not endomorphisms of the same objects, but we just identify them. So that's, that's something you can do to a category. It's some kind of uh, decategorification procedure. If you start with a K linear category, you, you end up with a vector space over K. Um, and if you start with a K linear monoidal category, which in the periodic table of higher categories is something like a two category with this boring at the bottom level, then you also get something more interesting when you do this kind of key categorification, namely you inherit an associative multiplication. So this HH0, this vertical trace is then an algebra. And in the case of circle bimodules uh, of type A, it's a theorem of uh, Elias and Lauda that this vertical trace if you treat the grading of the morphisms in the right way is isomorphic um, to, to a certain Reef product algebra. So it's you take polynomials, the, the underlying polynomial ring R, semi-direct product with uh, the group algebra of the symmetric group. And this can be proved in a similar way to this annular simplification procedure that I outlined last time. So this is somehow the warm-up trace. Um, there's, a, there's another trace, the horizontal trace, which is a bit more general, uh, but you can only do it if your cat, the category that you're starting with is monoidal. Or maybe you can also start with a, with a two category instead. Um, so so this, has been, this has appeared in, in many parts of mathematics. Um, the place where I've uh, first seen it and where it's somehow in closely interacting with link homology already is in a paper by Beliakova, Hadiro, Lado, and Chivkovic. And another good reference that I like is by Beliakova, Potira, and Verli. But it has appeared in, in many other contexts um, and treated by many other authors. So the, um, you could describe it as follows. So, so it's denoted pro uh, zero of uh, category C. And um, this is interesting. It's, it's going over. Anyway, so it's defined in the following way. So we start with the K linear monoidal category. So the trace will have just the same objects as the category C. Okay, if we start with a two category, we would restrict to one endomorphisms in that two category. But for a monoidal category, we just take the same objects. And now the idea is that uh, morphism spaces. So some people, some people like to illustrate morphisms in monoidal categories by string diagrams and two dimensions. And um, they're drawn 
drawn, usually drawn in the plane or in a strip. And here the idea is that we want to draw string diagrams on a cylinder, on, on, a, on a virtual cylinder in a sense, by gluing the left and right side of a rectangle. So formally, a morphism between objects C1 and C2, uh, so the home space between them, is spanned by following, uh, following kind of configurations. So we, we need to choose an object C, this is some auxiliary datum. Um, and then we consider um, morphisms in the original category C, F, running from C1 tensor C to C tensor C2. And the graphical interpretation goes like this. So um, you see this rectangle here on the right. I have the input C1 and C. They run into F. Or, and then the output of F is C tensor C2. And instead of... Um, drawing a rectangle like this, we actually think of this as being on the surface of a cylinder, like here on the right. And so it's important that on the left and on the right you have C because they should be glued together in a sense. Um, this is not it. Uh, so, so we'll take the span of such configurations, such, such tuples of F and C, but then we put a relation on this. And the relation says that if you have two of these squares um, and um, the, the morphism F is not just on, on its own there, it actually has a little component G in, and somehow on, on its right leg. That's the same thing as putting, putting it on the left arm. Okay, so there's a, there's a vector spaces and you quotient out by this additional relation that these two configurations actually represent the same thing. Topologically, you can think of this relation as saying that um, if you have a morphism G in, in that location, you can actually slide it around the back of the cylinder and it, so, so maybe it starts here and then you drag it around and it comes out the other side. So this is somehow what algebraically encodes this kind of gluing operation. Now this is supposed to be a category. We started with the monoidal category, you want to get out a category. So there's also a composition operation to, um, to take into account um, and you can, so, so I'll, I won't say too much about this except to say that basically what you do is you stack these diagrams and, um, and you need to use the monoidal structure uh, to say what it is that wraps around the back of the annulus. So a few examples, if you consider tangles that live in a cube and you take this trace operation, what you get are link significant annulus, no surprise there. Um, if you take braids and take the trace, well, yeah, you get positive annular links. Uh, was there a question in the chat that I should answer? Um, yes. Just, just, so I'm not monitoring the chat. You should tell me if there's something, please. It just popped up. Um, so Aaron Maslogi asks in the relation, is C prime the same as C? Uh, no, so okay, let's look. So, I, I think I had this on the slide before, but no. So, the thing is, G doesn't need to be an endomorphism. Um, let's let me try. Um, I guess my one note is stuck. Uh, fun. Oh no, I cannot scroll. Sorry. Now I can scroll. Okay, can you still see it? Yeah, okay, so the, so the, the idea in this relation is that the G has source C and has this target C prime. Um, and, and, and you impose this relation regardless of whether C is C prime. So there's some of this relation mixes uh, tuples FC um, with different Cs. Does that answer the question? If not, tell me. Okay, a few comments. Um, oh, what, question. Yeah, question. Why is category K linear? Because what if you have a pair of morphisms oh. collections of objects C1, C2? So if you have two morphisms, I mean, so there are some issues with addition, right? Why is this K linear? Um, yeah, I don't know why. Maybe you don't need k-linearity at all. Um, if you, well, of course, you I guess this 
I thought we were talking about that if you, if one morphism has one pair C1, C2, and another morph, sorry. So if you have one C, if a morphism has one C and another morphism between the, I mean, in the same. I see, yeah. So, so mm -hmm. how do you? Yeah, so there's, there's also an instance of the thing that we're doing later that somehow once you take the trace, you should maybe, um, you should maybe complete with respect, I don't know, you take some, some kind of additive completion afterwards, maybe that's related. But, but so here, here I think I don't want to, I don't want to assume that we start with a k-linear category. For example, I want to be able to talk about tangles and nothing needs to be linear. Okay. Let, let's come back to this question if it's still open, but I want to continue and, and get to the title of the talks <laughs> at the very end. Anyway, so a, a few remarks I would like to say. So in some sense, this trace yeah, is supposed to impose, somehow be the universal kind of um, category that you can map to where a trace relation holds in the monoidal direction. Uh, actually, this is not satisfied on you unless you you have uh, duals in your category. So if you have, if C contains right duals with respect to the monoidal structure, then you actually um, get an isomorphism between the trace of um, C1 tensor C2 and the trace of C2 tensor C1. Um, and if C has left duals, then this trace functor, which takes C into the trace of C, uh, is initial among all functors that are trace-like and have source C meaning that if you have a trace-like functor that starts at C, you can factor it through this trace. Um, and, and one, uh, so I started talking about the horizontal trace uh, by saying it's more general than the, the vertical trace, this H, H0. Um, and you can see this, that if you start with a monoidal category C and you look at the endomorphisms of the class of the monoidal identity in the horizontal trace, this endomorphism algebra, that's just the same thing as the Hochschild, the zero Hochschild homology, this vertical trace of the category. Um, and the, the relationship that you have in mind is that if you take this vertical trace, you look at endomorphisms, uh, modulo trace relations, and, and what happens here is that you basically rotate the cylinder. Um, so uh, and that, that's what happens in pictures. There's a question from Ben Elias in the chat. Yep. Uh, can, can, can you read it? Yes, I'm I can read it. I'm afraid that my um, thing freezes. Oh, don't worry. Uh, so does the compatibility between right and left duals with respect to morphisms imply something more? Not sure. Not sure. Um, yeah, I'm asking about cyclicity, but... Yeah, 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 I don't think you need it here for this. I think you just need the existence of those, which is um, which is uh, property, not structure. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're getting towards annular link homology, finally. Um, so, so what you can now do is, if you have, um, so now we don't care about arbitrary links, we only care about annular braid closures. So they, they are given to us as some conjugacy class of braids. Uh, let's just pick a representative braid, evaluate the Rouquier complex, which now lives in the bounded homotopy category of serial bi modules. Um, and then we do the following thing. So we apply the trace this trace functor termwise. So we have a chain complex of circle bi modules, and we, out of this, we get a chain complex of things living in the trace of circle bi modules. Um, and whatever that does to our K complex, we can call the annular havana krasansky invariant of the break closure. Um, and this thing has been studied, has been defined and studied by, by Keflek and Rose, and then in another paper by Keflek and Rose and Sartori, and using the annular simplification procedure that I talked about last time, um, basically what they can do is they can simplify the annular invariant of every, any braid closure into a chain complex of concentric circles with a very restricted selection of differentials between them. And what they then do 
is they, they evaluate this chain complex of concentric circles on, on various algebraic targets um, and get um, angular versions of um, Havana Frosansky homology, which take values in uh, complexes over representations of UGLN, for example. Um, if you, um, but the, so, so about a year ago, um, Eugene Gorski he and I uh, wrote a paper where we give a, a slightly different description of this, of this kind of invariant. Um, and it goes like this. So once you're at this stage, um, once you're at this stage, somebody looking at this uh, Anjela Havana Rosansky invariant in the bounded homotopy category of the trace of circle pi modules, um, you can, and that's maybe something that, uh, yeah, that's certainly something that I've learned from, from Dora Bernard Hans papers. You can apply a representable functor. So you can take home from the trace of the identity object into bla, apply it to your complex, and get, um, get a chain complex of, um, get a chain complex um, of modules for the endomorphism algebra of trace of one. So, and it turns out by annual simplification that this gives an equivalence of the Karubi completion of the trace of circle pi modules with uh, graded projective modules for the endomorphism algebra of the trace of the identity, um, which is nothing but by this rotate the annulus trick, graded projective modules for the, for the trace, the vertical trace of circle pi modules, which by Lala's, Lala's Lala is nothing but graded projective modules for this reached product algebra. And as I said, the main ingredient in this proof is that this, um, that the, uh, the horizontal trace of circle by modules is generated by the trace of the identity by module. And that comes from annular simplification. As a corollary of this theorem, uh, we get that if we take all of the Kahubi envelopes of traces of circle by modules in type A together, uh, we get um, a category which is equivalent to the following gadget. So it's the free symmetric monoidal, C linear, graded, Karubian category uh, built out of the following pieces of data. There's a single object E, which you can think of as the, the, a single circle. There's, this single circle has an endomorphism that we did, what do we call T, which um, is sometimes drawn as a, as, as a dot. So those of you have seen dots before, that's a dot. Um, and, and there's one more piece of data, and that is um, that it's a, um, it's a symmetric monoidal category. So um, if you're interested in what sort of link homologies factor through this construction, then this, these pieces of data tell you, so now it's free on these objects and and, and these morphisms and so on, this kind of language tells you that if you want to, um, if you want to specify a functor from here somewhere else, what you need to specify is an object E in a symmetric monoidal category, an endomorphism of this object of degree two, and um, your target should be, should be symmetric. So there's a braiding of the circle, there's at least a braiding of the circle with itself and this also has a topological interpretation. It's, it's somehow the two circles flying through each other. Um, and it then, so for example, here you start with these two circles, you move the dark blue circle over on the ins over the other one and move it to the inside and they swap places. And then it, it just turns out that it doesn't matter whether the dark blue circle goes over or under. Um, so in some sense, this this target for any Havana Frosansky homology, this free symmetric monoidal blah 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 category, is in a sense the simplest, in a non-technical sense, possible categorification of the ring of symmetric polynomials um, with coefficients and neural polynomials in Q. Uh, because um, you have objects corresponding to, to sure functions, and they're really just the sure functors applied to the object E. Uh, you you have a grading which gives you um, which decategorifies to the to the multiplication by this variable q. Uh, multiplication in the ring of symmetric functions is categorified by the monoidal structure, 
which topologically just means putting these annuli inside each other. And what else? So yes, so it's monoidal. Oh, sorry, it's symmetric monoidal, which corresponds to the commutativity of the multiplication in the symmetric function ring, categorifies that. And um, it would be a bit too boring for getting link homologies if there were no morphisms besides it, identity morphisms and, uh, and the symmetry. So we put the dot in, okay? But somehow that's how this comes about. And it's a very, it's a very natural setup. And it's, it's, it's great because now you can recover lots of link homologies. So this is, as explained by Catholic Rose and Sartori, you can do the following things. For example, you can specialize this object E, the, the circle, to, um, to this uh, Frobenius algebra, or, in, or you could also consider that, that as the vector representation of SL2. And now if you just take your endomorphism to be trivial, you get the annular Hovanov, the annular Hovanov homology as studied by Grigsby, Likata, and Verli. Um, and then if you turn on this additional morphism, set, set t equal to multiplication by x, you actually recover the usual Hovanov homology. So suddenly the, the annular invariant becomes a, uh, an invariant that doesn't depend that you are in the annulus. And somehow switching so, on, yeah, question. So can you remind us what t is? Yeah, t is the dot. t is the, the single endomorphism that this, um, that single generating endomorphism that is somehow um, part of this very universal category. And now if you, you somehow, once you have an, you can factor lots of, what I'm, what I'm arguing here is that you can factor lots of link homologies through that construction, through this annular construction. And I only need to tell you how to specialize. So once you've computed your invariant in this, in this very universal way, I only need to tell you where E goes, where T goes and where the braiding goes. Um, and, and then you get some, some, some link homologies which are well known. But when you say that when T is zero, you get, do you mean ASP homology outside of the Fritetsky Shakora? Uh, yes, that coincides with ASP. That's right. But um, I, I, I mentioned Grigsby Likata Verli here because you can evaluate on, on USL2. And, and then this becomes valued in chain right. complexes or representations of USL2. Okay. Just briefly, when you set t equal to zero, so somehow the usual differential corresponds to t equal to x case, and then the field of graded version of a differential corresponds to t equal to zero? Uh, yes, exactly. And switching on the differential starts the spectral sequence from annular I was just saying that in the annular homology, if you have an untrivial circle going around the function, you put a dot on it, it's zero. Is Exactly. But there has to be that's, a deeper statement than that, right? That's, no, that's just it. There has to be a deeper statement than just this observation of putting a dot on it. So yeah. it's, <laughs> it seems that it's really bad. Paul, yeah. can you see this as a as as somehow a holonomy as you get twist as you go around the circle in one direction? No, no, but I'll come to holonomies. Yes, it's a great question. No, T is really just a dot, and you put it somewhere. But T will is get a whole. Yeah? Is there a natural way to put all the ends together? Is there an object that? you could specialize to get all of these examples that you're talking about? Um, well, only this universal thing. Um, somehow, only... You, you sort um, of... On, on that, only that. The, the slide that you had on the, the screen just a second ago, where you had yeah. the, the, the SLN or the GLN cases, all of them as yeah. special cases. Are, yeah. are, so is there some global object where you just specialize n to be two or three or four and get all of these three bullet points or two bullet points? I'm not sure. Okay, all right. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how to do this. I mean, what you, what you can certainly do is you just put your favorite finite degree polynomial yeah, mod out by that, and you get some deformed versions. But yeah, maybe maybe let me just 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 verbalize what, what the next bullet point is. If you evaluate E on, on this other Frobenius algebra, 
uh, polynomials mod x squared, uh, x to the n, then um, for if you, if you actually remember that t acts interestingly as multiplication by x, you get the usual one of the unscaled GLN homology. If you set t equal to zero, if it's from a filter by um, dots on essential circles, then you get the Catholic Rose annular GLN homology, which you can think of taking values in chain complexes for UGLN representations. And you can even re you can even recover the triplet graded homology from this, but it's a bit more subtle. So taking Hochschild homology of uh, of circle bimodules, uh, so the Hochschild cohomology of circle bimodules, you compute you can compute as a home space um, in this in this annular invariant, and you you need to you, you need to take homes from a sum of sure functors associated to hooks into the trace of your of your bimodule. Um, depending on which degree of Hochschild cohomology you want to recover. So if you want to see this, you should look into the, into the paper with um, Eugene Gorski and Matt Hogenkamp that was uh, um, that I referenced last time. Yeah, so, but in, in a sense, whenever you can, so this, this ties in with, with Nito Kitschlu's question from last time, uh, whenever you um, have a link homology, that can be factored through this categorification of the Hecke algebra, then, and then you proceed to an annular version of that, um, then, should, then you can factor it through this kind of universal, this universal setup where you take this free symmetric monoidal blah, 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 category generated by a single object with endomorphism and, uh, and the symmetric grading. Okay, um, so, so this is a really nice story. Um, but um, there are some things that one would like to do with it that don't quite work. And here are two examples. So let's take, so one thing, so at this stage, we somehow have a nice categorification of the symmetric polynomial ring. So there are indecomposable objects corresponding to sure functions, and we have a uh, topological interpretation for the multiplication and so on and so on. Um, one thing that we don't have is an action of the full twist. And and we can see this in the following way. Just take the full twist, which um, somehow this, uh, the Roquet complex already a bit simplified, um, looks like this. You already know what these, what these pictures mean. And then once we take the trace, um, each of these webs simplifies first into a collection of concentric circles, and I can split them further into sure functors of the, of the, the individual circle. Um, and I'll get a complex of wedge twos and sim twos. And after some cancellation, some Gaussian elimination, I can see, uh, so in homological degree zero, there are two copies of wedge two. And then in homological degree one and two, or minus one and minus two, depending on how you count, there's another sum and which is somehow uh, a piece of well, it's a wedge two and a sim two linked up by a differential. The observation that I want to make here is that this decomposes into three direct summons in an interesting way. But the trace of the identity on two strands only decomposes into two summons, namely sim two and wedge two. Because the trace of this identity braid is E tensor E, and E tensor E decomposes into sim two of E plus wedge two of E. So this tells you that the full twist cannot act by an auto equivalence in this setup because it would take two direct summons and create three and that's not invertible. The other example that I can give um, goes like this. So this is even more wishful thinking. So we'd like to have an action of the annular invariant on, um, on the, the, braid in, the braid invariant, for example, by wrapping the annular thing around the braid. The thing that comes out is no longer really a braid. So let's assume that I'm in a setting where I can talk about arbitrary tangle invariants. So I'm taking an annular invariant, I'm, take, uh, so I'm taking an annular link, I'm taking a tangle, I'll wrap the annular link around the tangle, and I want to um, have all of the, the link homologies, the link invariants uh, fit into some commutative square where I can compute the annular invariant and the tangle invariant separately. Um, or alternatively, I can compute the tangle invariant in the bottom row. And then I want some kind of algebraic version of this wrapping operation here on the right, which takes the annular invariant and the tangle invariant and it produces the tangle invariant of the wrapped thing. Let's look at an example where both the thing that I'm, um, 
the braid that I'm closing in the annulus and also the braid that I want to uh, wrap around is just a single strand, in which case the closure of, of beta is really just a circle. And now I want to wrap that circle around the strand. Now, uh, this morphism T is sometimes, as I said, illustrated by a dot. And then the idea is that these dots are somehow freely floating on that cobordism. But now you run into a problem because once you wrap the circle around the strand, um, the placement of the dot actually matters. So um, once you have, um, once you've wrapped the circle around the strand, you see some cut open hop flink like here. And now the dot should be an endomorphism of this thing. And depending on whether you interpret the dot as being on the left or on the right of that cylinder, it will act on completely different parts of this link diagram. And these actions will not be equal. They will be homotopic, but they will not be equal. And, and somehow the trouble here is, and, and that says that you cannot have these kind of wrapping operations if you, you, if you use the, this annular invariant constructed via the, 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 the horizontal trace that I had here. Um, and the problem here is that the operation, so what we're doing here is we're, we're taking the braid beta and then we're feeding it into this picture where we somehow braid, the, the braid beta full twists around the, the braid gamma. And now we would like to say that this kind of operation factors, um, so we would like to say that this is somehow trace-like because, um, um, well, okay, so we I would like to, to close this up and, and, and somehow um, say that this, um, this wrapping operation is somehow trace-like, but it's not. It's really it only trace-like up to homotopy. And our construction of horizontal trace doesn't remember homotopies. So let me go straight into the derived story because I'm running out of time. Um, so the problem in the previous trace construction is that we should actually do the gluing to the annulus in a derived way. We shouldn't enforce a relation uh, somehow on the nose that things slide through the back of the annulus. We should, we should make these things not equal, but only homotopic. So let's introduce a formal homotopy between these pictures. Um, and so, the, so, so somehow we want to relate G being on the right and G being on the left of the scene that I've drawn here as a vertical purple bar. And the, the name for the homotopy here is just the same picture, but now there are two vertical scenes, two vertical bars, um, and G is put beside them. And the differential works like this. So the differential says, take the alternating sum of erasing one bar. That will give you this, this difference. And somehow up to, so in, homo, in homology, you will, 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 you will recover the old relation. A problem if you, adjoin this formal homotopy is that you'll get lots of new closed morphisms which we don't want to which we don't want to float around we want them to be exact so we want to adjoin even higher homotopies so now to make so the thing here that you see here on the right if you compute the differential of that you'll see it's zero uh, so this is a closed morphism we want it to be exact so we'll introduce a new homotopy and now this will have three bars big surprise um, and and so you'll have um, so, so these things in degree, in degree two, I will have three bars and they will have some morphisms between them. And then we keep going. And the differential will always be the alternating sum of erasing these purple bars. And if we zoom into the region where I've put the bars and rotate the picture 90 degrees, then, then what you see there, um, so it's about what this construction actually does, is it, it's just constructing a two-sided bar complex for this category C. This is some simple known thing. And now we can define a derived version of this category, uh, this derived version of the trace of this category C. It's going to be a DG category. The objects will be still the same as in C. Um, and the morphisms between two objects will no longer be a vector space. They will instead be a chain complex in degree zero. This will be um, somehow um, the usual types of pictures, but now not modulo any kind of weird relations. Instead, the relations will be imposed by the image of the first differential, which takes these pieces that I've introduced as, introduced as homotopies. And then in the next thing, you'll have somehow the higher homotopies and so on. And, and now there's a, 
if you have to actually define uh, the composition operation again, and it's a bit more complicated than before, and it uses kind of a, a shuffle product. Right. So um, this also has an intrinsic description, which we don't need. Um, it also works if your input is um, it's a DG monoidal category, for example. Um, and there's again a relation to a kind of vertical trace. And the vertical trace here is just, um, it's just Hochschild chains um, on, on your category. And so in some sense, um, the endomorphisms of the monoidal identity in this derived trace uh, are computing Hochschild homology of the category. And one cool thing is, so you still have an action of a, of a version of the center on the trace. So here, uh, there's a derived, a derived version of the Drinfeld center, which still acts on this derived trace. And um, usually, if you perform this trace, it's not idempotent and complete, not triangulated, so we formally complete it typically, and this is denoted by Tor bar. Okay, um, so now the next thing we need, and then maybe I'll keep, keep this very brief, we need to compute the Hochschild homology of, of servo pi modules. Um, so the main ingredient here is that category of chain complex, the TG category of chain complexes of servo pi modules, uh, so a, a monoidal TG category, has a semi-orthogonal decomposition uh, on objects which are the, the Rouquet complexes of positive permutation braids. Um, and semi-orthogonal decomposition in practice here means that you, up to homotopy, you have no morphisms which go down in the, in the Abuja order. Um, and that allows one to compute the, the Hochschild homology of circle bi modules, um, first um, as a vector space, the, the idea here is that Hochschild, Hochschild chains of circle bi modules are equivalent to Hochschild chains on chain complexes of circle bi modules. And then because of the semi-orthogonal decomposition, you can zoom in to endomorphisms of um, these positive permutation braid Rouquier complexes. Because they're invertible, um, these endomorphism algebras um, are equivalent to just endomorphisms of the Rouquet complex of the identity braid, which is just R. And so the answer that you get out is that the Hochschild homology of pseudo bi modules is isomorphic, as an A infinity algebra at this point, to the Hochschild homology of this ground ring R, semi-direct product, um, the group algebra of the symmetric group. And at least the, 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 the multiplication, the mu2 operation is what you think it is. It's what, what's suggested by this expression. And for a while, we, knew, we, we thought we had a proof uh, um, for showing that this, um, the, the G-algebra um, partial change of circle biomodules is actually formal, but uh, then it turned out to be a lot more subtle than we thought. Um, but if you, if you look at this answer and spell it out what it is, this Hochschild shield homology, you see that relative to this Elias Lauder result that I mentioned before, we now have um, the old variables xi, which are the dots on some parallel concentric circles, and we also now have thetas. And the thetas are somehow the monodromy, is the monodromy of the dot around the circle that, that Nito Kichlo was asking about before. Um, and this result also generalizes to coxative groups. And now um, there's, a, there's a result in, in this paper. So now we focus, and I should also say that the, these arguments that I've just said about the whole shield homology of circle bi modules work for coxative groups more generally. But if we zoom into type A, then we have a result in this paper with Eugene Gorski and Matt Hogan count, which is analogous to the result with Eugene that I mentioned before. Uh, this derived trace of circle bi modules is, gener is generated in type A by the trace of the monoidal identity. And then taking harm from the trace of the monoidal identity gives us a quasi equivalence between the, the, the horizontal trace and modules for the vertical trace. And, um, and so, so what is this perfect right A infinity modules for the endomorphisms of, of the monoidal identity. Uh, so perfect right A infinity modules over over um, this A infinity algebra where we don't really know what the higher A infinity structure is. 
But the interpretation here is, uh, as before, the axes are dots, the thetas are dot rotation homotopies, and the, the, the permutations are permutations of concentric circles. And now you can, so I'm, I'm, I'm taking two more minutes and then I'm done. So if now we can define a DG uh, a derived and the Hovan of Zonsky invariant. So for an N strand period, what you do is you compute the Rokier complex, T of beta, you compute its trace, its derived trace, and then you take the representable functor, take home from the trace of the identity into the trace of your Rokier complex. So that's the thing. And you can, via the result above, you can um, interpret this as living in some kind of algebraic category. And just to give an idea that this is not just abstract nonsense, but one can actually compute with this, let's look at, let's revisit the example of the full twist on two strands. Um, so here, the problem was that in this, uh, in this chain complex, once you, once you take the, so the one of the differentials in this chain complex looks like I've illustrated here. So you have these two webs. You have a dot on the top left and a dot on the, bot on the, top, on the bottom left. Taking the usual trace, these things will become equal and the difference will become zero. So this, dif so this differential will become zero and the complex will split further than we would like. Here, these things are only homotopic. And if I want to somehow, um, so in the trace, simplify this complex, I have to remember this homotopy. And what it will buy me um, is an additional long arrow which now, um, so at this stage, uses one of these homotopies that lives between two purple bars. And then once I apply the representable functor and uh, write everything in terms of sure functors of, uh, of the individual circle, I get a chain complex, which has the following pieces. It has a single wedge two on the left, and then it has a more complicated complex filled out of wedge two, another wedge two, and a sim two, and they're linked in this way by x's and thetas. And now we actually see two components. Um, and so here, um, you, so because this thing has two components, um, we're a bit more optimistic that there is an action of the full twist um, on this annular invariant. And indeed, there is because the full twist happens to be derived central. OK, the example two that I gave with encircling also works, um, is resolved by, by remembering these these homotopies and somehow um, encapsulating it, encapsulating these homotopies in the trace construction. But so I'm already over time. I'm stopping here. Thank you very much. All right. Do we have any questions for Paul? Paul, may I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, so your derived setup here has these odd parameters theta, right? Yeah. Um, is there a natural spectral sequence you could set up uh, that with respect to those parameters that somehow re is reminiscent of the Rasmussen uh, spectral sequences? I'm not sure. Uh -oh. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, Eugene, do you, can you remind me if we've discussed this? I mean, you need to evaluate the circle in something, but like if you evaluate the circle in polynomials in X, uh, then you can define a differential of theta to be X to the N, and that's like SLM. Homology more or less, tautologically. But again, this is all annular, and the one needs to check that, like, that it extends to non-annular homology. But like very roughly, I think if you set theta to be x to the n, you recover some homology. Yeah, that is that, that's the reason why I was asking if all the ends could be put together into one context. But I think this annular thing is this kind of universal. Maybe mm -hmm. I want to add that like. At least in underived setting, you can say that one single circle evaluates to some object in some symmetric monoidal category. It doesn't need to be a vector space. You can think whatever vector bundle in some space or something or representation of something, and like you still have evaluation of your 
annular braids into that uh, somatic monoidal category, whatever it is. So I think if you talk about annular links, you have tons of different evaluations. Most of them won't uh, factor through usual links and they don't define, they, they won't satisfy the Markov move, but you have like tons of evaluations of annular invariants, like arbitrary somatic monoidal category. And here, like if we ignore all the subtleties again, you just need to present an object and the morphism X and the morphism theta. And yeah, that's your evaluation, but it could be like anywhere. So it's, Actually, I have a question. Can you go a couple of slides back? So one of the main results is that if you take the category of circuit bimodules, right, and okay. then you take the category of circuit bimodules and you're taking its, taking its Hofstede homology. Yes. Okay. Uh, and you've circuit by modules so for the symmetric group SM. So N is fixed. Yes. Uh, N is fixed. Um, Here they are, yes. And, and then you're saying that Hausen homology is an L. So Hausen homology is an algebra, but what's the multiplication structure? Once again. It comes from the monoidal structure. So to, to define Hausen homology, you don't need the monoidal structure in the first place. So somehow it survives yeah, and yeah. you... Yeah. yeah, but the fact that it's a super, well, but it's not super commutative algebra, in particular you have the cross product with the symmetric group mm -hmm. and you identify it as up to infinity structure. So identifying the homology, you identify the Hoshka homology, but you don't know the infinity algebra structure, but you expect it to be trivial you expect the infinity structure to be trivial or formal? He, that, that was, yeah, that was our expectation. Okay. Then um, can you, um, can you explain the origin of thetas? You said it's monodromy of a dot around the function. Yes, yes, okay, I can explain that. So uh, let's look at back at the, let's look back at this picture here. So, Imagine, so here, here I'm describing somehow the, 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 the first level of homotopies. So now imagine that F is trivial. There's no input strands to F. There's no output strands to F. There are no strands at all, except that I put a dot in the region where, 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 where the letter G is. Then um, if you apply a differential, you just see a dot somewhere on the cylinder minus a dot somewhere on the cylinder. So that's zero. Um, and, and the theta is, is really just the thing on the left inside the differential. So it's, 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 it's somehow this thing here with a, where, where you put a dot here in, in the region. So that's a, that's a closed element. And that's a generator. And so you, you can think of it as somehow uh, the homotopy for for the dot moving 360 degrees around the annulus. It's somehow placeholder homotopy. If you consider this example that I had where you, you want this wrapping operation um, and somehow you would like to move, you'd like to have some placeholder homotopy for moving the dot across the seam because once you somehow, instead of the seam, you put something complicated there like wrapping around some other tangle or so, the, then the dot that will move beyond, somehow behind the other tangle, will require some homotopy, and it will not just be identical on the left and on the right. And somehow having this placeholder homotopy here allows you to keep, you know, to evaluate to such situations. And do you, do you see a conceptual reason for the action of a symmetric group? Uh, so so you, you do expect some kind of braiding on the category that you get out because you expect this to be, all of these constructions to be factorial under braid-like uh, cobordisms of annular links. And one of these cobordisms is just take the outer circle to an inner circle and that gives some kind of braiding um, that this is um, that this is a symmetry. It doesn't matter whether the circles fly over or under. 
I don't really have a good conceptual understanding for. Um, Thank you. For Hochschul Tamolzy, maybe I want to mention the result of Belikova, Putir, and Verle, where they do it for annual RSL2. So they have a similar story where they have slightly different category and they compute Hochschul Tamolzy, and there they actually prove it's formal for, for RSL2 Tamolzy. That's the GL2 form paper? Yeah, no, so it's a no, previous paper. Previous paper, annular. Yeah. I forgot. Quantum annular. Quantum annular invariance. Something. Yes, something, something. And also, maybe why Hochschild homology and not Hochschild cohomology? Uh, Hochschild homology is the, the thing that generalizes um, generalizes the trace or the co-center. And, and Hochschild cohomology is the thing that generalizes the, the, the center itself. So they're, they look, yeah, they look fairly, there's, there's some asymmetry there. So for example, you always have an action of the center on the trace, or Hochschild cohomology on Hochschild homology, but typically not the other way around. And, and because we're doing these annular invariants somehow Hochschild homology or the trace are the more natural things to look at at this point. So, so you can do a version of Hochschild cohomology for the study. Most yeah, time. so this, like, yeah, I guess so, yeah. I mean, I think it's a very interesting question. What is Hochschild cohomology of Zorgil Bram models, for example? Yeah. I think it's related to the recent work of uh, Ben Elias and Chiyu, where they compute some derivations on the category, but I have no idea. Thank you. I spaced out for a second, so I wish I heard what was just said. <laughs> We were discussing that this whole, so here we compute Hochschild uh, homology of SBIM. And I think like what you guys do uses as part of Hochschild cohomology of SBIM, no? Where you say that you have a derivation. Uh, I, I, I have no idea why that seems to be Hochschild cohomology though. I don't know. But I think Michael's question was, can we compute Hochschild cohomology? And we can't, but it's an interesting question for sure. Uh, ben, also you, you had asked, uh, um, sorry, I'm on my phone and I can't see my video, so I don't know if it looks reasonable. But anyway, um, you had asked if there's a Gerson over structure. Uh, that's also something that's only, that's defined on Hochschild cohomology, not Hochschild homology. Uh, but you have a Cohen's differential on Hochschild homology, which is which we see actually. So there is some interesting end of so in this setting it says that there is an interesting end of under of the trace category, which corresponds to 360 degree rotation of everything. Uh, and that is an interesting and non-trivial end of under which we actually see and can compute. Maybe just also a question about the monotony and the theta. So, I mean, it sounds like it's something that would work in high, in great generality. Um, so being able to get this theta given X, is that something like if you have an object of a monoidal category and an endomorphism of an object, you can get the map from the exterior algebra times polynomial algebra into Hoffman homology. So how general is this appearance of I mean, of course, it might be zero eventually, depending on what the category is, but is that something that you can get out of any monoidal category, any endomorphism of an object? I think you need an endomorphism of a central object or... Yeah. Um, yeah, you would need your object to be central, I would say. But like, for example, sorry, I, I, can, I, can I chime in? Uh, so here, um, so there's an, there should be, an, I just would also like to comment, there should be an SLN version of this story. Uh, I mean, you, the definition, the basic definition would be just sort of essentially verbatim what's in the, our paper. But, um, anyway, so in the end, if, if you, if you looked at, for example, like the SL2 homology of a link, 
uh, the the algebra that acts on you know each component determines an action of this uh, two dimensional algebra. But actually, there's a bigger thing which acts, which would be the Hochschild homology of that algebra. So you have homotopies; these thetas slide x's across. Uh, there are these monodromy maps that slide x's, or correspond to the homotopies sliding x around a component. But these, because x squared is zero, these homotopies satisfy certain higher relations, and you would expect an action of the of the entire Hochschild homology, this infinite dimensional algebra, for each component. So that's the sort of thing that. So yeah. let me just interrupt just to clarify what uh, I think Matt said before. So by the central object, you really mean in this case the identity object of the category. So if you have yes. an endomorphism of the identity object of the category, then you can get a map from the exterior to the normal algebra into Hochschild homology of the category. Yeah. And so all you need is a monoid category. So then any endomorphism of the identity gives you a map from exterior times the normal into the Hochschild homology of the category. Yeah, and then you can ask how relations in the algebra might manifest in relations between exterior generators, and that gets complicated. Thank you. Yeah, I would add that, like, if you have just have an endomorphism, you have a which like commutes with itself and whatever that uh, you have a algebra homomorphism from uh, polynomial algebra to endomorphism of identity. And then this induces a map from Hochschild homology of polynomial algebra to Hochschild homology of your category, basically tautologically. And Hochschild homology of a polynomial algebra is x and theta, but you can take here Hochschild homology of the C of x mod x square that's big and complicated, and that should also map. So basically, that's what Matt was explaining. For the purposes of this recording, um, let's thank Paul again, but we can continue talking.